All right, hallelujah. The last animal behavior podcast. This one is going to focus on social behaviors. Um, So let's get right to it. Uh, Social behaviors, interactions between individuals. We're usually talking about uh, of the same species, uh, but not necessarily always. And we'll we'll see an example of that as well. Um, We're going to look at several behaviors, uh, communication uh, between uh, organisms, um, and and many others. I, I, let's not. Let's just get right to it. Uh, first, communication. There's several examples of different ways that animals can communicate. It's very complex behavior. Uh, honeybee communication. Uh, if we look at this uh, little YouTube bummer, um, uh, I'll see if I can find another example of it. I'm sure I can. But uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, bees can actually dance. Obviously they are doing complex movements to tell other bees in the hive where a food source is. Uh, Extremely complex uh, and and very um, uh, uh, very uh, well done means of communicating. Um, There are many chimps that have been taught uh, sign language now uh, and uh, some people disagree about how much they are really truly communicating ideas, but I think a lot of that uh, really has been debunked now. They, they are very often very clearly communicating, uh, uh, and if you have any interest in the topic, it really is a fascinating topic. I highly recommend this uh, little video, Why Dogs Smile and Chimpanzees Cry. I'm going to put it on the playlist. Uh, it, it looks not just at chimpanzee behavior, but all kinds of animal behavior. Behaviors and again, very much emphasis on shades of gray and focus is not just on uh, animal communication, but uh, emotional uh, life in animals as well. Um, Communication by song. Birds and insects are particularly famous for this. Frogs also do it. Uh, Most often, song is used as a um, way for animals to recognize that they are of the same species and it's usually part of some sort of mating ritual so that they they know they're they've got the right species and and it's a way for uh, animals to demonstrate their fitness to each other and so on uh, as we've talked about it's a mix of innate and learned behavior the song is very often learned from a parent though as we've seen not necessarily always. Um, It's often uh, an uh, imprinted type of thing. Um, An insect's song is completely innate. It is uh, not learned uh, any aspect of it. Um, Now, deceit. And if you're communicating with someone, you, it is possible you can communicate to them something that is not the truth. Humans do this all the time. Um, Is it possible that animals do it too. Um, Well, um, deceit has been observed, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, in certain kinds of fireflies. Um, Fireflies blink, they flash, uh, to attract mates, and certain fireflies may have a characteristic pattern of flashes. Um, A male will flash and a female will give off a characteristic pattern in response to his flashes and he's looking for that pattern to recognize that he's got a potential mate and to go mate with her. However, um, it has been observed that certain females of different firefly species will actually respond Uh, with the appropriate flashes to a male of a different species um, they will approach as as mimicking as though they were actually the female he wants to mate with and what they actually do is when he comes to mate uh, this imposter firefly eats him Um, so uh, deceit she's pretending to be something she's not Uh, it's uh, kind of a clever use of communication Um, uh, a, another way to communicate is um, not using signals, uh, or at least not visual signals or auditory uh, signals, but chemical signals, pheromones. And you really should probably know this word. Um, pheromones um, kind of sounds like the word hormones, and the chemicals, I think, are somewhat 
uh, similar in their nature. Um, but these are chemicals that are um, given off outside the body and they cause a response in an animal of the same species. So um, when you see your dog peeing on the side of a tree, he's not just leaving pee, he's leaving pheromones as well. Chemicals that say, hey, this is mine, this is my territory, you stay away. There are all kinds of pheromones, uh, usually not detectable by a different species. Uh, in other words, we cannot detect the pheromones that your dog leaves behind, but other dogs can. Um, um, insects use them, mammals, as we've already talked about, use them. Uh, we, uh, this is, pheromones are one way, if you've seen, I don't, I can't remember what movie, cartoon movie it was, um, Ant's Life or something like that, where the ants are following the pheromone trail, uh, and so they know where to go with their, their food items and whatnot back to the, uh, the, uh, the colony. Uh, here we can obviously see this lemur marking his territory. Um, uh, so all kinds of ways that pheromones are incorporated. Pheromones can be quite powerful. Um, they've seen some pheromones that can be detected by uh, other members of the species many kilometers away, so they can be very, very strong and can draw animals in from, from some distance. Uh, some uh, arguments exist that humans even emit pheromones. Uh, I'll uh, leave this, I'll put a link to this article on the webpage if you're interested uh, in that, but uh, there's been some discussion about women living in a dorm type situation together, uh, coming to have similar uh, menstrual cycles and so on, and it's argued that uh, pheromones are behind that, um, so at any rate. All right, completely, well, not completely different social behavior. There's still communication involved, but this is referred to as agonistic. I, you often want to think of it as antagonistic. If you antagonize somebody, you're fighting with them, but this is not antagonized. This is called agonistic uh, behavior. So let's get the word right, but it does kind of mean fighting. It is a contest between two animals of the same species in which one is going to come out the winner and one is going to come out submissive, okay? Uh, it is a threatening, a combination of threatening and submissive behaviors. Usually these are symbolic behaviors. In other words, usually there is not real actual fighting to the death in these uh, behaviors because really that's to no one's benefit. To really fight means that someone's going to get hurt. Even perhaps the winner gets hurt and is damaged because of the fight. So uh, the best uh, use of these kinds of behaviors is perhaps to have a contest so you can tell who the winner is but the victor is is known but nobody has to get hurt. The loser doesn't get hurt. Maybe he can come back another day and be the winner. The uh, the, the winner is not damaged and can go on and, and do the things he needs to do. Okay, um, so uh, these agonistic behaviors ultimately determine who gets food, perhaps, who gets a mate uh, first, and so on. Um, we see this kind of behavior in snakes. These, these snakes uh, are having kind of almost a, a twisting uh, battle where they don't strike at each other, but they're testing each other's strength. Um, this guy uh, is showing an ag aggressive, uh, actually looks like he actually has his tail between his legs and he's ducking his head, so perhaps he's taking on the submissive posture here. Um, agonistic behavior and the the fighting, fighting back and forth that goes with that, um, often leads to uh, developing within a group of animals a dominance hierarchy and what that means is kind of a social ranking. There will be the alpha dog and then the lower ones on the totem pole after that. Um, and so what this again determines is who's going to have access to the most resources. Um, the top dog, if you will, is going to have the greatest access to mates. Those lower on the totem pole until you get to the lowliest of the low uh, is going to get the remains. Okay? This can also be referred to as pecking order. Quite literally among chickens, the lead chicken, the alpha chicken, if you will, um, uh, 
usually controls the others by pecking, literally pecking them, um, and uh, it goes kind of on down the order. There's a beta chicken and often on, on, on down to, I guess, Zed or whatever, um, who gets pecked by everyone. What a life. Um, so, um, and again, other similar types of things uh, are observed happening in other kinds of animals as well. So why have it? We already mentioned it. It prevents dangerous fights where people, people, where animals and people could get hurt. If you have this kind of pecking order, organisms know where they need to fall. The uh, adequate resources are going to be there. Um, uh, for the ones that are most likely, that are strongest and are most likely to survive, we're not going to waste resources on those where it's kind of <clears throat> iffy if they're going to come out on t uh, and, and survive or not. Uh, so, best use of resources, no one gets hurt. Okay. Um, courtship behaviors is another whole s category of social behaviors. Um, why have them? Uh, w what's the point? Um, to A, make sure that you are uh, engaging with a member of the right species, um, to, for a female to assess the, or, or the, the reproductive potential of a male. Is he going to be a good mate? Is he vigorous? Has he got good genes or not? Um, uh, are they even of the opposite sex? We want to make sure we've got the opposite sex here. So uh, all kinds of things. Um, and uh, there are many displays that we can show. We'll probably, I, I'll link you to a few on the YouTube page and we'll probably look at some of these in class in September. Uh, now, um, in some species, uh, courtship um, allows usually the female to basically observe a bunch of males that may be doing some kind of display for them and allows the female to kind of choose. Why? Why is it always the female that gets to choose? It's not always, but usually. Why? Well, the f it is more critical to the female to actually choose a really good mate because she is investing a whole lot more into these offspring than he is. Eggs are enormously expensive for the female to produce. They have all this yolk and so on, plus she often is the one, though not always, doing the parenting of the young. Um, so it is really much more important to her to get good genes from that male. The male just wants to get his genes everywhere he can, but she wants to get the very best genes, and so it is very important for her to get a good mate. Um, what we see here is something called a lek. It is a group of a bird of birds called sage grouse. This is a species of bird. A lek is a group of them, in which the males are performing um, in an effort to get the female to select them. Um, and the females in this video. Oh bummer! Another one. Um, let me see if the next one works, because I've got one on the next page as well. All right, yeah, there we go. Um, the females are kind of on the perimeter of this grouping, watching while the males do this kind of crazy strutting. And I don't believe you're hearing the sound. Um, no, you won't be hearing the sound, because of the way I have this set up. But um, uh, they are making these really strange noises, and whoever makes the best weird noises and does the most obscene thing, I guess, with his little poofy sack in front, is going to get the girl. So again, um, uh, mating behaviors, courtship behaviors, so that the female can get the the very best uh, mate uh, and the very best genetic material she can for her young. Okay. Um, more courtship behaviors. Um, uh, this is, of course, showing you a peacock, uh, classic male display. Look at him displaying his feathers, and the there's a there's a male there watching, but there's also females just uh, uh, watching him as well, trying to decide if he's worth the effort or not. 
Um, so uh, this idea of the females choosing the males is called assessment. They, um, oops. Okay, um, and we've talked about all of this. Males mate with as many as possible, uh, and so on. So um, we've talked about this. We didn't talk about this, but this peacock tail is termed a secondary sexual characteristic. It's not directly related to sex organs, but we see this enormous tail in the males, but not in the females. Why? Because he is got to, uh, it's very important for him to get selected, so he's got to draw attention to himself. And when you think about it, um, this tail, it takes an enormous amount of energy to produce it. Uh, it is basically a big hindrance. It makes him slow. He can be grabbed by a predator more easily. So why would natural selection favor that? It seems like he's, he's begging to be eaten, but uh, it also does help him get noticed by females. And apparently that uh, is uh, very, very important in getting his genes to the next generation and reproductive success. Okay, um, alrighty. Uh, there are three types, speaking of courtship behaviors, there are three main types of mating systems. Um, we'll just quickly go over them. Uh, promiscuous mating means you mate with whoever, there's no lasting pair bonds, and just you're mating with whoever all the time. Okay, promiscuous mating. Um, polygamous mating is when you have one individual of one sex who is mating with several of another. Uh, polygyny is when it is one male mating with many females. Think of a typical lion pride. He is going to be the father of all the cubs in this, uh, all the cubs that these females give birth to. Um, uh, he's investing only sperm, so he's like, I can impregnate as many of these females as I wish, but again, the female has got a much greater investment um, uh, in, into, into the uh, young. Um, however, sometimes we do see the other situation where a female is mating with many males. In some cases, <clears throat> uh, many, many males will uh, try to mate with the same female and, and frogs and, and other animals as well, and that's called polyandry. It's less common. Um, okay. Um, the last one that we'll talk about is monogamous. One male with one female for life. Geese are monogamous. Uh, the, the male helps raise the young and they will be there together forever uh, until one of them dies at any rate. So I guess that's not really forever, is it? All right, uh, another behavior we ought to talk about is cooperation in animals that we see, uh, pack hunting or herding and things like that. Uh, here uh, we see a video. Um, helps if I press play, doesn't it? Of uh, some, I believe, jackals uh, going after uh, a wildebeest, and you can see they are cooperatively doing this. They're all going to go after this one weakened uh, little animal and try to go after it. They are cooperating. We see it very often. We see it in dolphins. There's a uh, video of a dolphin hunt that you can check out um, and so on. Uh, now fortunately for this baby, nobody's messing with that baby while mama's around and she does come in and save the day for that little guy. Okay? Um, now, this perhaps is one of the greatest puzzlements in animal behavior, altruistic behavior. Altruistic behavior is when you do something that does not benefit you. It benefits someone else. It's easy for us to understand selfish social behaviors. They benefit you. They make it more likely that you will get your genes to the next generation and so on. But how do, you, how do you justify, in terms of natural selection, a behavior that might put you at risk but benefit someone else? Okay? So 
altruistic behavior you need to know what that is it's behavior that reduces your own fitness and increases the fitness of the recipient of the behavior maybe um, you are protecting someone from getting hurt that puts you in the line where you could get hurt and helps the one that you are protecting okay um, now there are some ways where maybe it's a little more obvious how it could be beneficial um, if you are protecting your own young you're trying to get their genes to the next generation that helps you as a species so to speak it's under it's understandable why natural selection would favor that um, but there are some other cases where it really truly doesn't seem uh, like uh, it can be all that beneficial um, meerkats are commonly seen rescuing family members or um, comforting family members that are injured uh, to no real benefit for themselves um, but then again if you think about the tight social bond they have perhaps the tight social bond in itself uh, helps their species survive and so even though their particular genes um, may not be benefited this overall collective social behavior makes them uh, very much more likely as a whole to have their genes passed on to the next generation um, this is showing a uh, meerkat uh, that uh, I believe is going to be rescued uh, has gotten himself into some trouble yeah this little guy um, and uh, I believe I'm not uh, a not very close relative eventually comes in and there you go and rescues him from the potential hawk okay uh, another thing to think about are bees the workers are sterile they can't even reproduce the worker bees are sterile the queen is the only one that can reproduce but they will defend her to the death uh, why um, again because presumably collectively it is helpful to get the genes to uh, uh, of uh, at least someone they are somewhat related to to the next generation okay so um, this is what we've just talked about when parents sacrifice their personal welfare for their offspring it is still increasing their own fitness because if they sur offspring survive those genes get to the next generation um, the idea is that perhaps helping other close relatives uh, also has perhaps a similar result this idea is called inclusive fitness it's also called kin selection so this is taking it maybe out a step further that you know it's not not just beneficial you don't just help genes get to the next generation when you help your own children but if you help your sister's children well they share their genes with you too to some degree and so helping them helps uh, get their uh, get, get some of your genes to the next generation and perhaps that's why that has been favored by natural selection okay um, so bees and and other animals the ultimate in altruism as we just talked about you have worker bees that can't even reproduce but they will fight to the death for the queen in the colony um, we see actually there's some mammals that do that as well uh, these are naked mole rats and they are colonial mammals which is very rare uh, indeed um, the uh, some animals in this colony are sterile much like worker bees they have no hope of ever reproducing their entire life is servicing the queen um, uh, but again all of them working to get these genes of this one queen to the next generation they are related to her and so um, it is it is the similar idea to the bees that at least the genes are going into the next generation even if it's not the specific workers genes it is genes from this this family this colony okay um, all right let me just nope it's not there so sorry um, I think that's the last slide for this and yep 
just that's all folks so um that's it that is all of animal behavior i know that was kind of a lot and boring and whatever for you i'm sure go to the youtube um playlist and click on some of the videos that i'm going to put there and uh that's where so you can really get some interesting stuff highly recommend um uh some of those Check it out if you have time, if you have interest. All right, thanks for watching. I will catch you in the next set of podcasts, which will cover our ecology unit.